Take it away, Sherman. Hi, everybody. How is my name is Sherman Shoresman. Um, I'm part of the TME group here at Quantum. And I'm going to give you a short demo on our management UI and then a demo on one of the really cool features of ActiveScale called dynamic data placement. Before we get too far, I want to level set. Um, there's a lot of talk about scale and appliances and uh, deployment options. So there is a wide variety of deployment options with uh, ActiveScale. Um, anywhere from the uh, you know couple hundred terabytes up into the 74 petabyte. But that is a packaging limitation, not an architectural limitation, as Thomas mentioned. Um, today, what I'm going to be using for this demonstration, a P100. Um, what is the P100 made of? Let's take a quick look. I'll take the front bezel off. And up at the top, we have three nodes here we call system nodes. This is the access layer that, the access layer that Thomas was talking about. This is where the customer would connect their network into these three nodes uh, for end user IO. Then we have these six storage nodes. Each one of these happen to have uh, 14 12, 14 terabyte hard drives. And this is the data layer. And then in the middle, we have a couple of redundant 10 gig switches. This is for our private network. So all the data placement, you know, when it's erasure encoded and we spread it across nodes, all that happens on, on this private network so it doesn't interfere with the user's IO experience. Um, and all this uh, packages up into a nice, clean 11U, 11U of rack space. Um, so even though this is a relatively small system in the whole active scale product line, it, it does actually pack a punch. Um, this particular configuration ships with a uh, one petabyte raw storage. It, it, it happens to be configured with a 13.4 storage policy, which gives it 11 nines of durability and 670 terabytes of usable space. It has six 10 gig interfaces for the end user IO. It can support 3,000 concurrent connections and IO rates of up to 7.8 gigabytes a second. So just really quickly, that's what we'll be working with today. I'm going to show you our user interface and just touch on some of the key, key features. Uh, and keep in mind, this is the management user interface. Um, when you log in, you see a view like this. And this is a, ActiveScale is a centrally managed system. So whether you're uh, a single site, multiple site, very small, very large, you're going to see the same thing with the exception of this resources tab, which has an icon that will depict your configuration. We report on capacity, both usable and raw, and any one of these panes, you can drill down and get more, more detailed information. Uh, our durability policy, Thomas mentioned uh, erasure encoding, how that works and how our durability policy works. This system happens to be using a 13.4 policy, meaning when an object or file comes into active scale, it's erasure encoded into 13 pieces, and then those 13 pieces are in parallel streamed down to the uh, data layer, which makes it very fast. Hey, Sherman, how do you, yes. how do you identify a failed drive in a massive system like uh, you showed on the other slide? A failed drive? Uh, we have monitoring agents that continuously monitor everything in the system. Uh, drives, PSUs, even the fans, everything is monitored. Sure, uh, but to replace it, how do you replace it if you've got thousands of drives? Oh, well, I do have an example of how we identify that drive. Uh, it'll tell you which drive is, is failed, and then we have in another screen, I'll show you in just a second, um, we, can act, we can turn on the LED, start blinking the LED, and so the user can come in there and hot swap the drive. Did that answer? Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, we get some detailed performance. And this is a small lab system. We've got some metrics over here on the right. It's got a few users, I guess just over a million objects and I guess oh, close to a couple hundred thousand files. Um, over to the left, we have a we have a navigation menu. And so you can navigate the system either through the navigation menu or drill down. I'm gonna drill down through one of these tabs. I wanna see the health of my system. So let's take a look. This is um, the health of the system, similar to a 
my previous slides, I uh, showed, I described the components of the P100. So this image on the left is similar. We have our three system nodes on top, and it looks like one of those system nodes has a problem. So that's interesting. We'll take a look at that. We have our two redundant switches in the middle and our storage nodes on the bottom. Let's take a look at one of these storage nodes. And to, going back to that question of how we know uh, which drive to replace, well, this is a high level view of the system and there's no red on this system, so it looks good. And we can drill down into the fans, the PSUs, the hard drives, and it'll tell us here if it's online or not, or if it has a problem. And then we can just go over here and turn on the LED so we can run out and uh, hot swap that drive. But this is uh, disturbing me a little bit why we have uh, an error on system node two. So let's check it out. And it looks like, oh, we've got a red dot on a PSU. It says degraded. I did notice when I logged in, and sure enough, it is degraded. I did notice when I logged, it, logged in, we had an error message up here. Let's see if that is the same error message. And indeed it is. The PS2U is failing. So we do monitor everything. Um, this is a lab system. So chances are, you know, somebody had their hands in the rack and uh, unplugged or the PSU lost power for a period of time because it says failing, not failed. Um, so from active scales perspective, all it knows is that uh, uh, there was an irregularity on that PSU. Um, I'm going to test that theory by just telling active scale to ignore that one alert. And if the message persists, then I guess we might have a failing PSU. Uh, quick look, uh, account management. There's a couple kinds of, uh, there's a couple kinds of users in this system, uh, admins and non-admins. I'm an admin, so I can see stuff like access keys. I cannot see stuff like, oops, I cannot see stuff like uh, uh, secret keys, which is in the uh, S3 world is uh, the equivalent to a password. Um, so the administrator can create accounts, can create access and secret keys. But the end user can't. My colleague, Frank, um, if he wants to use the UI, he's going to get a different view than me. Um, but having said that, anything he needs to do, he can do through the S3 API. But if he wants to do the, use the graphical user interface, he's going to get a view, what, something we call AS view. And let's just go in and see what Frank's going to see. Now, this is a kind of a sluggish VPN. so. It'll take a second to load up here, but this is Frank's view. He can manage his account. He can manage his object storage. He can create buckets. He can uh, enable versioning. He can, uh, if he's in a compliance situation, he can enable object lock, which is essentially worm for object storage. He, had, he can define retention periods. And he can, from this point on, after he gets access to the system, he can also manage his own access keys. You can generate, disable, and delete access keys on demand. Going back over to the uh, management interface, um, we can... Uh, I, have a, I have a question about the, um, okay. the backend. I don't see uh, any encryption. Uh, is is not uh, yet implemented? Are you planning to implement it? Uh, we have encryption. Um, the security tab there. Sherman. Yeah. It's on the okay. security tab. So Great. we can have system-wide encryption or object-level encryption. Sure. Okay, good. Um, and uh, one thing I want to, yeah, sure. We're a centrally managed uh, system. So, you know, active scale systems can get pretty big. Um, and a, a fully scaled out active scale system can be uh, 81 nodes and 74 petabytes. That's pretty big. So. If you had to manage that by, you know, on a node by node basis during an upgrade, that would just be a disaster. So we have one click upgrades. And uh, all we have to do is point active scale to the upgrade image, tell it to go. And what it does is 100% in the background and 100% non in a non disruptive fashion will go do every one of those 81 nodes, do the upgrade, do the reboot if it has to. Totally, uh, totally transparent to the end users. When you are doing an upgrade, um, I suppose the, each node will undergo a reboot. 
Yes. So what happens to access nodes when they reboot? I mean, oh. when there are active connections there, uh, the customers, the, the clients lose their connection. No, we move the IP to a, a different node. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it, it's not interrupted. We, we do rolling upgrades all the time. Um, we do not interrupt connections ever. I'm going to demonstrate data pipeline services or DPS. Uh, what is that? It is a proactive notification service. Um, it's a mechanism in where active scale will send out notifications based on certain events that take place in the system and then services can act on those notifications and my quick demo is going to uh, uh, work a, uh, some simple notifications at the object level for the, for the put and a remove um, and it's very useful just about any use case that can work in an autonomous fashion can trigger work uh, can trigger workflows based on these uh, notifications um, in a modern notification system, we have message producers, message consumers, and a message broker. Now, back in the old days, when we had when we started messaging, we had a uh, a system would trigger a message, but if somebody wasn't listening for that message, it would just go off into the ether and disappear, and just get lost. So, modern uh, messaging systems have are asynchronous and have a message broker, and they work like this: an event triggers a message and that message producer will send the message. Well, where will he send it? He'll send it to the broker just in case there's no one listening for it. So he sends it to the broker. And then the consumers come along. They, uh, whenever they wake up, they come along and say, hey, message broker, do you have any messages for me with this particular subject? And the broker says, why, well, yes, I do. And that has all the information necessary for the message consumer to trigger a workflow. Now, this is pretty fancy. I mean, back in 1998, uh, we, did, we, we were experimenting with workflow automation by scrubbing file systems and looking for changes. And so I could do basically what this is doing with a single command. But what's changed? Well, modern storage systems are huge. You just can't go looking for data anymore. And they're complex. We don't even know where they are half the time. And we need real time data. When something happens in our in our storage system, we need to know about it right now. And my favorite is that it enables workflow automation. So I've got a real quick demo on what we're going to do with workflow automation. I have a bucket, and in that bucket, I've created uh, a notification service. I've configured it so when anyone puts or deletes an object in that bucket, it sends out a notification. And so this active scale system, in this case, is the message producer. I also have a message broker and consumer in my lab, but I, and I'm gonna do a demo that uh, demonstrates transcoding, but I don't have a transcoding service in my lab. So I'm going, I've opted for a hybrid computing model and I'm gonna use a cloud-based third-party transcoding service. And what I'm going to do is upload a file to ActiveScale, which will trigger a message. That message will go to the broker, the consumer, will consume that message, and that message will have the file name, the bucket name, and all the information it needs to trigger a workflow. And that workflow will, using the, the ActiveScale S3 API, will upload our video file to the, to the cloud-based transcoding service. That transcoding service will create two copies of that with different resolutions, and then the workflow will download those to the active scale system. And the original file that we uploaded there can simply be deleted so we don't have to pay for storage. And this is a valid use case. Streaming services, when they get a piece of content like a movie, you know, they don't just stream that out. They transcode it into hundreds of formats. So when they do stream it out, they can stream it out in the format that's appropriate for the device it's heading to. So this demo is very quick. I have a desktop in my lab, and I have four open windows on that desktop, a browser window into a bucket called Quantum Transcode Queue. And I've got another browser window into another bucket called Transcoded Files. Transcode Queue, when I put an object in Transcode Queue, it's going to send a message to my consumer and start the workflow. I also have 
a browser into my local file system with some source high resolution cell phone uh, video. And so I'm going to start up this uh, consumer just real quickly. It'll take, take, take just a sec. So I now have a consumer that's running. It's listening for messages from this transcode queue bucket. So let's just drag a file up there, see what happens. So like I said, this is an asynchronous operation. So the consumers go frequently and looking for messages. And so it should happen here fairly quick. Okay, so the put was detected, which, which triggered the data pipeline. And so the first thing that happens, it is uploading that, that file to our transcoding service. The transcoding is happening right now. It's a small file, so it shouldn't take very long. And now the transcoding is done, it seems. So we are downloading the transcoding files. And I said the destination would be in this transcoded files bucket. We can just refresh. And there they are. And then it removed any of the work files. So we could, uh, so we don't have to pay for any of the online storage uh, for that, from that transcoding service. So that's it. That's a very simple example of how data pipeline services and object notification work. So what did we do? We, we enabled data pipeline services so we could automate a workflow. So when somebody uploaded a, a video into ActiveScale, it would automatically go to a third-party transcoding service, bring down the files and store them at ActiveScale for safekeeping without needing to pay for the transcoding storage services, storage without, sorry, without waiting, without the need to pay for the storage from the transcoding services.